Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. My name is Rohan, and I would be the moderator for today's exciting event. I would firstly like to thank you for taking the time to attend the Interactive Learning Power Hour session hosted by Harbinger. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Power Hour is a series of interactive roundtable discussions amongst industry stalwarts, where they would be sharing their experiences and insights on a particular topic. So the topic for today's discussion would be competency mapped learning, scalable and adaptable approach. Before we begin, a few quick housekeeping tips. In case you cannot hear the audio, ensure you have selected the right speaker for audio output. You may test the same to see if it is working fine from the audio settings option on the lower left corner of your screen. And if necessary, please dial in using a phone. But now it's time for introduction. Our host for today's roundtable is Poonam Jaipuria. Poonam is the Vice President of e-learning at Harbinger and a seasoned e-learning professional with over 16 years of experience. She started her career as a programmer and moved on to take key responsibilities across a varied range of functions from product design, engineering, and management to leading product sales and marketing. Poonam currently heads the Harbinger Interactive Learning Business Operations, along with sales planning and strategy. She is enthusiastic about new learning technologies and is an active member of the thought leadership team here at Harbinger. We welcome you, Poonam, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohan. And a big hello to all of you. We have a great audience of professionals today and an outstanding panel of experts. Before introducing our panel, I will love to take a few minutes to set the context of this power hour. So here is our game plan for today. We are going to focus on three things today. Understand the need of competency-based learning in your organization. No challenges to implement it with traditional systems. And strategies and framework to deliver competency-based learning using existing systems. And with that, <clears throat> By the end of this power hour, you will be able to understand the importance of using competency model learning over traditional e-learning approach, know the limitations of traditional systems to tag, deliver, and track competency-based learning, and ways to overcome limitations from traditional learning systems. So let's try and understand first with an example, what's a competency? So what I thought was, let's take something which is common to all of us, and that's driving, right? We all drive. And it's interesting to know that just driving needs 12 different competencies for, to, for an individual to be a good driver. Now, I'm just sharing four of these out of the 12. Now, imagine if I had knowledge of how to use an accelerator and a brake. Can I really back up safely? No. Just knowledge isn't enough. But if I keep practicing, then I will have a skill to back up safely. But does it, is that enough? Unless I am able to make the right decisions to drive under different conditions, this knowledge and skill is also not enough. So that's what makes a competency. This is how we define competency. You're just a graphic to understand that. What's a competency? It's a cluster of knowledge, skills and personal attributes that helps an individual perform a given task in real life. In the earlier example of driving competencies, knowing how to use accelerators and brake is knowledge. Backing up is a skill which I can learn with practice and ability to take right decisions is a personal attribute of decision making. So together, this makes a competency for backing up safely. Here we can see that in education, competency-based education is fairly commonly used in K-12. This infographic, what you see, shares what competency-based education means and how, does it, how is it different than traditional education. So competency-based learning is an approach where learners move from one learning level to a higher level based on the demonstration of knowledge rather than based on the time spent on a specific course. I'm sure all l &D professionals would understand the, the importance of what I mean by time spent on a course. This approach 
ensures that learners learn at their own pace and focus more on mastery of knowledge and acquiring skills. Not just in education, competency-based learning can be very beneficial at workplace as well. Once the competencies are clearly defined and mapped to various job roles, they can be useful in designing right learning experiences. It benefits an individual, an employer, a learner to increase one's self-awareness and also aid in the career management of that individual. But an organization has many more benefits of implementing this at various levels. It can help in succession planning, performance management, skill gap analysis, reskilling of individuals for new business demands. So just competency-based learning methodology can go across and uh, various levels and benefit there. So that's the context for today. And with that, let's get ready to welcome our panelists for today. And we have amazing panel here today. So let me first introduce Anshu Gaur. He is a global tech executive, entrepreneur, board member with 30 years of tech experience. He is also an expert in restructuring businesses for growth and scale. Anshu has been associated with several promising early stage companies through his startup accelerator, Pravega, and is active in social sector, helping scale impact. Currently, he is the co-founder and group CEO of Ideas to Impacts, an innovative technology solution company. Anshu, welcome uh, uh, to the panel today. And it's a pleasure to have you in this power hour. Thank you very much, Tuna. Uh, glad to be here. And let me also introduce Eric, who is the executive director of Talent Transformation, an, organizing, uh, an organization uh, promoting best practices for staying relevant during these times of change. Eric is an accomplished leader of international businesses and associations focused on talent, assessments, and success. Eric currently serves on board of advisor and as chair of IEEE 1484.20.2 Working Group developing, developing Recommended Practices for Defining Competencies. And he serves on the PwC New World New Skills Advisory Board and facilitates conversations on future-facing vision of skills, workforce transformation, ed tech, and industry trends. Welcome, uh, Eric. Welcome to the Power Hour, and it's our honor to have you today with us. Oh, Poonam, thank you so much. And it's so good to see you and, and seeing uh, Anshu here as well. So Eric, we'll start with you. Uh, what makes you interested in this topic? And also if you can help us uh, define how you look at competencies and uh, share, a, share a little more light there, that would be great for our audience today. Sure. So. I think the world of competences is changing for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that we see automation coming on, new tools, new robots uh, coming in, AI, machine learning. And what that's doing is changing the nature of the tasks that we do at work. So maybe a job role right now has uh, 50 competences, 25 competences required to perform the tasks. But now some of those tasks are gonna be handed off to machines and some new tasks are gonna be coming in. So how do we know uh, uh, of the new tasks that are coming in, what are the competences for those tasks? So we're in this, uh, in this world of change. Uh, this change was accelerated by uh, the pandemic because people uh, expressed uh, tracks and automations. Uh, we also found that our locations changed. We used to work in office. We were quickly shifted to home to, to pre uh, protect our friends and family and, and uh, protect from the virus. So that changed a lot of the tasks we do and the way we perform tasks. Now, what's happening with automation and, and, and robotics is they're taking the repetitive tasks away from us. Now, they used to be taking away just the mechanical repetitive tasks. So the assembly of cars or the assembly of computers would be done by robots. They were mechanically assembling tasks. But now we're seeing cognitively repetitive tasks 
are being taken away. So for instance, accountants doing audits can now be done effectively with AI and machine learning. Uh, and there's many other roles that we can see how, how this is um, uh, impacting. So we're gonna go through this transition uh, and we're gonna have to get down to a task level and, and recognize we're not gonna, uh, not gonna want to displace all the thousands of accountants and just push them out to grass and expect there. We're gonna have to find the new tasks that uh, need to be performed. Well, it just so happens that an auditor has the kind of knowledge and skills and competence to be a uh, um, cybersecurity expert. Now we're in desperate need of uh, uh, cybersecurity experts, and we're going to have a growing glut of, uh, 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 of accountants that do audits. So if we can match these together at a competency level, so we know that forensic accounting is similar to forensic cybersecurity, we can then promote this more free flowing of labor. And, and also with machines doing mechanical tasks and repetitive tasks, that lets us do the more human tasks of working in teams, of communicating, of collaborating. So the bottom line here, here is that um, if we get it down to a competency level, we can do some gap analysis, we can do some training, we can specifically provide the learning uh, that, that can build people's uh, competence in, in these competencies. So that's a long answer to your, to your question, but I hope it, it was helpful. Definitely, Eric, the very helpful. And I'm sure the, there's a lot of audience from the LND community here. So uh, this will definitely guide them not only for today, but even from a long-term perspective, because um, I somewhere I read actually that just 10 years back, the number of skills or competencies needed were about 178 for an individual uh, you know, to perform their jobs. And today it's about 924. So what was, wow. you know, in 10 years, it's five times more skills someone needs to do wow. a good job of what they're supposed to do. So, mm -hmm. and I also read somewhere that every three years, what I'm doing today, I'm not going to do that after three years. So anyway, I have to be prepared for uh, learning new things constantly so that I am afresh and I can continue doing a good job even in future. So, so how can so the we- the phrase for that, yeah, I'm sorry right. to interrupt. The catchphrase for that is the half-life of skills. So where a skill may have been useful uh, to us uh, for five or even 10 years, now because of the nature of the changing nature of work, the, those skills yeah. are generally uh, reducing, the half-life uh, reducing. Yeah, so it means we L&D yeah. have a place in this world uh, <laughs> for a long time to come because we're going to, as we go through these transitions, we're going to have to be learning a lot. Definitely. And today's power hour, let's try and see if we can see how competency model learning can actually help us set up a better, you know, foundation for these changes which are going to come in future for all of us. Thanks, Eric. And with that, we'll uh, ask Anshu to share his thoughts. What makes you interested in this topic? Um, thanks, Pulam, and uh, uh, great thoughts from Eric. I think. We not only answer the past, but also set us up for the future um, very nicely in terms of everything that is going on in the world around us. Um, but kind of coming back to your question a little bit in terms of what made me interested in the topic, I, I think it's a bit of a story. Um, I, I lived in the US for a long time and decided to come back to India in 2006. I was a part of various organizations and as I was leading these organizations, one key observation for me was the following, that uh, we as a country in India uh, had incredible talent. But however, the skills were not there. Um, and, and, and again, uh, it was more about the fact that the context of what is required to be best in class was really not as common as it, we would like it to be. And as we talk about the IT industry, tech industry, outsourcing industry, um, you know, it's not enough to have a degree and, and, and consider that as a sufficient, necessary and sufficient condition to do a best in class uh, performance of a role. Um, and, and what was frustrating to me at that point in time was that, okay, we have the talent, we have the energy, but clearly we're not performing to the extent that we 
we ought to be. And that kind of led me to thinking in terms of, hey, there's got to be a science to this. You know, as, as an engineer, you want to solve that. Well, I'm sure Eric will tell us about the, the left brain and the right brain and those aspects. But, you know, approaching it from a scientific perspective, it became important to understand, hey, what does it take for one to perform a role effectively? And, and that kind of started the interest. And then again here, uh, of course, there are hard skills and technical skills, but equally harder is the softer skill that, uh, that, that we, we just take for granted, but, but, but again, uh, uh, make the you know, difference between success and failure in any, any job, any role, any uh, individual anywhere in the world. So, so that got me interested. And more recently, the, the role that uh, I'm playing, uh, you know, a dear friend of mine, Giddy, uh, started this interesting company called Ideas to Impact. And, and the, the purpose of the organization is, uh, is, is very succinctly captured by, well, the future is already here. It's just not distributed evenly. And, and we are on a mission to distribute the future evenly, essentially saying that we want to take the cutting edge, high end jobs and perform them at the human edge in smaller towns uh, in, in the country rather than everybody relocate to polluted cities, poor infrastructure, four hours commuting, keeping the pandemic discussion aside. It, it, it was just not sustainable. So, so our organization is focused on enhancing and developing skills in, in smaller towns where, where the talent is and ensuring that we are able to deliver best in class outcomes for our customers globally, wherever they are, and do it uh, in, a, in a way that we are giving back to the society, driving sustainable growth, but not doing it uh, at, at a discount. We're not looking for favors from anybody. That's our purpose. That's what we want to do. But at the same time, we want to want to uh, deliver best-in-class outcomes. And for that, you need best-in-class skills. And hence, the pursuit of doing that at scale required us to bring extra and additional focus on how do I build those skills effectively? And, and how do I do it recognizing Hey, where is the talent? Where do we need to go? Where is the job? What, what are the outcomes that are to be delivered? So that's kind of the context of what got me uh, initially to be interested in this topic uh, that has sustained over, over the years and, and then uh, more uh, invigorated more recently because of uh, the role that uh, we are trying to play. Very, very interesting story, uh, Anshu, and uh, I can see the journey and also like your social uh, mindset and the, the passion to make a difference in the social community. I can easily see that through your story. So uh, great and would love to hear more as you have implemented this and you're planning to implement it at a much larger scale. I know that. So would love to hear a lot from you as we take this discussion forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Pune. So let's uh, have you, Eric, shares a little more today about this question on how is competency-based learning relevant for workplace and why is it so relevant even today? Would you like to share a little thoughts there for all of us? Oh, so I think there's there's multiple dimensions that are, are are happening at the moment. One we're we're seeing, and I'm not sure how global it is, but I'm hearing that it's global. Is this concept of mass resignations? So what happened when people were coming to the workplace? There was a social cohesion amongst the individuals working cooperatively and collaboratively. As they dispersed to working from home, they they had to develop these new skills to uh, maintain that social cohesion. And some uh, organizations did it well, and some didn't do it so well. And, and so talking to your L&D community, this idea of developing these social skills of how we uh, can, can um, work with each other cooperatively, collaboratively at a distance is, so we've got that dimension, the, the growing significance of L&D, not only to teach the hard skills that Anshu uh, uh, described so well and, and the importance of, of, of those technical skills, but also those social skills that, that Anshu also mentioned. And through our uh, better understanding of neuroscience, we understand how teams will work collaboratively uh, and cooperatively together but it needs those softer skills, that psychological safety, that uh, 
Um, so not only does the individual have responsibility to learn emotional intelligence, to understand themselves, to understand others, but they have to understand how they're working in a social context, either to, together or at a distance. I think the other um, uh, thing, when we, when we look at this balance between technical skills and those softer skills, um, in organizations that I've worked with, I would see thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of technical skills might be described. So if we go to electric utility or we go to a railroad company, we see a lot of those technical skills. But when we come down to the softer skills, maybe we see between five and 15. There aren't hundreds of these things, you know, to understand the cells and understand that it doesn't take hundreds of things. But in this growing world of work, they're more and more important because we're going to be working more as humans together and, and finding ways to have social cohesion at a distance so that we want to work with each other is going to be another uh, challenge. So um, the, the third point to make is that as the world of work is changing, um, employers have to better convey to higher education and to schools the kind of skills that it would like them to develop. So, so many schools, colleges, universities around the world are developing schools for the second industrial revolution, even the first industrial revolution. But we're now in the fourth industrial revolution. We need these new skills and employers have to define how, these, uh, how they want people to turn up on their first day of work uh, after leaving school college year. And um, competencies and competency definitions are great communication tools. It helps people think about what is the level of competence I need and what areas of competence do I need. And now I can describe not only to my L&D team, but also to my higher education partner, my school's partners, so that we can build this uh, uh, kind of social learning together. Great, thanks, thanks, Eric. And you are right, uh, the resignation scene, even we experienced here in India, and mm -hmm. to be honest, even at Habenja, at the initial part of the year, but yeah, over a period, things settled down, as people say, so hopefully yeah. we are better today. So, yeah. And uh, this may be a good time. We could actually ask our uh, audience here with a quick poll. Rohan, if you could open that poll for us. Uh, which of these are the biggest challenges the LND faces today? And we'll take about like 10 seconds to go through this and respond. And uh, then Rohan can show, share the results with all of us. All right, uh, we have almost 40% of our audience who have voted. Let's give it another 10 seconds, maybe. Well, I'll be one of the percent because I won't be voting. I don't want to skew the poll. All right, we have more than 75% votes, so I will quickly end the poll and share the results. Sure. So the results are clear. And I think, Eric, what you alluded to seems to be one of the key challenges. Again, talent retention. I see that it's got the number to 54% vote. And uh, of course, skilling and reskilling of employees is big. And I think you both have talked, Eric and Anshu, about this. Um, challenge the team has today so i it's real we can sense it from the audience as well so we'll probably go a little deeper into this and let's see then how can competency-based learning help in skilling and reskilling employees and maybe anshu this time we'll start with you what's your thought how does it really help well, I think um, one of my kind of look at um, before we kind of talk about, uh, I think we've established the need for skilling risk uh, to, to a great day. And, and yes. once that is established, then the first thing which comes to mind is, hey, how do I build the foundation? <laughs> right. Uh, and and, and I, I kind of see this 
questionable about uh, competency based uh, you know learning model as the foundation over which you can do the things that you want to do uh, and 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 it's not the only thing but but for us to think in terms of the right skills for people to perform a particular job uh, the, the foundation is a competency based uh, model in at least in, in my uh, my experience and um, you know and they're just talking about my personal um, personal experiences um, I think I, re I recollect the slide that you shared earlier. We, you know, we picked uh, an, um, uh, an interesting model called the Ask model, and, and it happens to be, you know, very similar to what you talked about: uh, attitude, skills, and knowledge. Uh, so, for one to perform uh, for, for a particular role, one has to have a certain set of competencies in one something called the attitude, a bucket called attitude another bucket called skills and another bucket called knowledge. And I think you described that in the chart that you for one to perform that particular role. Uh, you've got to have competencies and then you need to understand proficiency levels of how one needs to perform each one of those competencies. So that's the larger framework. Now, your question was about, you know, in terms of how do you use it in an organization? And the way I see it is that you use it from the organization before somebody starts in the organization. Uh, because oftentimes we, we uh, interview people and hire people uh, based upon you know, our biases <laughs> that, uh, that are there in every interaction we take. We're not, we're not being scientific about uh, or being clear about what, what is the role definition, what are the critical tasks that need to be performed, and hence what are the competencies and what is the proficiency levels for those competencies. So, so I kind of see that starting at the front edge of understanding, uh, using that definition of competencies to one, bring the right talent into the organization, taking the biases out to the best possible extent. We can never take them out completely, but you can at least uh, do that through, through some kind of a scientific uh, method. Once the person is in the organization, inevitably the question becomes, hey, you are expecting them to perform a particular role, uh, and now uh, the role is dependent on the project. A new project comes in and you are expecting them to do something else. And now you need to determine, hey, what are the competencies required for this new role? Like Eric described how the roles are changing all the time and half-life period of those roles uh, that, that exist. So, and that's real life. You, you, you are hiring uh, talent for the long, long haul and you, it's, 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 it's up to you to help invest in the talent. So the, the question of understanding where somebody is with respect to the expectations, so that, hey, this is what is expected to be done in this role. This is where you are in terms of the competencies. Then helping people to get from here to there is something that that we need to do. That goes back to your reskilling question that you talked about, upskilling, reskilling, however you describe it. And the final thing I would say is that that it's also important for organizations to to uh, provide career mobility. Uh, we talked about L and D. Uh, a lot. So, so how does one know what are the options? If I'm a large organization, where can I go? Uh, well, I can go uh, to different places uh, with two ways. One, knowing uh, what are the things that are expected in that particular role and knowing where I am with respect to uh, what is expected and what the gaps are. So, so that other piece of providing career mobility also becomes an important component. So I'll kind of say three things identifying the right talent, getting them into the organization, getting them to be effective to uh, them, meaning all of us to be effective in the roles that we perform, and then providing careers as, as, as people progress through the organization. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, Anshu. That was an interesting way to look at competency for skilling, reskilling, and even growing in an organization. So that's amazing. Eric, your thoughts on this? Uh, Eric, you're on mute. My apologies. Uh, I, I agree with what uh, Anshu was saying. That is very well articulated. In the career mobility, I think that the definition of competences can help us understand where we are and then help us understand uh, where we can get to. What are the possibilities? What are the opportunities out there? And um, one competency that is often overlooked is this competency to handle uh, ambiguity the, the competence to be agile, have a desire to learn. So sometimes we, we might set up a training course and at the end of it, we don't feel that the people really learned a lot or maybe they weren't taking it seriously. 
maybe we take a step back and say, to Anshu's point, are we recruiting people that have a desire to learn, that have a, a hunger to better themselves? And uh, maybe we need to bring more folks like that into our organization. And maybe we should teach these kind of skills to say, through a typical change management process, saying, yes, you can stay where you are, but here is the consequence in the future if you simply stay where you are. Because the world's going to change around you, automation's going to change around you. So by, uh, by learning new skills, you're just going to be able to flow into this new kind of work hopefully better paid kind of work, you're going to have a more satisfying career. And, and going back to this point of the mass exodus, when people feel that their employer is caring about them in the, in the present and in the future, they feel this kind of social connectivity to their employer. So again, for L&D to um, not only just teach skills or teach the behaviors, but kind of get to the supporting personality traits that will help enable people want to learn and want to grow and want to fill these new uh, roles that are evolving. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, for that. It's very clearly identified, like why is competency-based learning important, not just for learning what's true for today, but for your future growth and in fact, even for different kinds of roles, which we would have never imagined we could play. So I can definitely easily see the benefit of implementing this in an organization. So the next question obviously comes is, okay, if this is so good, what are the challenges? I mean, along the way, and maybe what I could should do is ask our audience here first, what do they think if they had to implement something like this? in their organization. There's a poll which is up on your screen. What challenges do you see you would face while implementing something like competency-based learning? Rohan? Yes, Poonam. So we have 77% of our audience who have participated. I'll quickly end the poll. Let me share the results. Okay. So uh, Eric and Anshu, any thoughts on... Uh, the audience poll results does this resonate with uh, you while while you're talking to other organizations or unsure while you implement this in your organization uh, it, it does uh, it, it does uh, to a great extent and i think you know I, uh, so i'll tell you and and, and i can see those uh, questions were kind of uh, right on the money in terms of uh, what was defining the competencies right it, it's uh, we, we talked about the model in terms of uh, for a particular role to be performed, you really have to have the, uh, the role definition correctly and you have to have the competencies uh, defined in, in those buckets that I talked about, attitude, skills, and knowledge, ability, skills, and knowledge, and the proficiency levels. And that's not an easy, easy task, even though uh, a lot of that is, 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 is available. It's, it's a, it requires an execution discipline which is hard. So, so it, it might sound straightforward, but, but it is not because, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those, I kind of even call this maybe a soft skill to have the discipline to do some, some, some of this. Yeah. We, we just take it for granted. We just think, hey, you know, I can do this. And, and, and so you kind of end up uh, ignoring that. But uh, so, so having that framework or the model is, is as clearly as was uh, identified by the participants. Uh, the other three areas are equally challenging, and, and I'll tell you where uh, you know we, we have struggled. Um, so one is the model and the framework, and of course, some mechanism, whether it's spreadsheets or a tool which enables that framework to be to be operationalized. Where am I? How am I performing? What do I need to do? What are the gaps, and so on. The second is the content. Okay, I know that this is where I am, and this is where I need to go. So where is the content which goes along? with helping me audio, video, whatever kind of content gets me to get better. 
right? Now it can be push learning, it can be pull learning, we can keep that aside, but then the content piece becomes critically important. Yeah. The third piece which becomes important or is a challenge uh, in what I've seen is, is, is around, okay, well, uh, well, the best way to learn is hands-on. So, so while I give you the content, but am I giving you the ability to learn hands-on and you're, you're getting into it stuff? And, and again, I'm talking uh, a bit on the technical side. So clearly uh, hands-on becomes increasingly important. I know hands-on is equally important for welding <laughs> as it is for you know, full stack Java development. Um, so, so, so the hands-on piece becomes uh, critically important. And then finally, if you've done hands-on, hey, how do I do the validation and certification and benchmarking against the uh, stuff? So, so I think those four things taken together become the challenge. And 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 I would say that um, I, as we have uh, you know uh, talked to them offline, it, it's uh, you don't have one way to kind of solve it. So you have certain tools or methods which are good in one area versus the other, and you have to kind of pull it all together. And then if it's not in one place, then the, the discipline that is required to make it work effectively starts to, hey, I need two, two systems. You're asking me to go here to do this and the other place to go. So those other aspects become resistance to change that we are trying to drive as we bring something like that into the audience. Great, great. I, thanks uh, for that because sorry eric go ahead go ahead eric yeah no i i completely go agree ahead. i think the other thing worth mentioning here is developing and maintaining competency uh, definitions and competency frameworks is hard so um it needs it needs specialists it needs experts it needs people actually doing the work to define it and um now that so we, this is one of the reasons over the last decades uh, that we have struggled with this. Um, the good news is there's a lot of effort into trying to make this easier. So uh, as you heard at the beginning of my introduction, I'm the chair of the IEEE group to develop recommended practices for developing competences. And in that role, I also work with the IEEE group to develop these schemas for um, holding, so database schemas for holding competencies. And our goal between those two groups is to help competency definitions become more discoverable. So that the idea of creative commons competencies will be out there. So we're already working with groups that are making kind of open source competencies. Now they'll have a container, a schema, and it, the schema is designed in a way that they can be discoverable. And we will get to a place through other initiatives that are going on where uh, we, can, we can do a search for uh, competencies and we can pull it in as a database. So one is discoverable, another is transformable. So we've got the IEEE schema, there are other schemas, but as soon as you've got a competency into a, into a machine readable format, you can transfer it to other formats. If you're stuck in a PDF file or a Word file, you're gonna to struggle to transform it and kind of reuse it. And the advantage then is if we are making things discoverable and transformable, we can then make them tradable. So it'd be much easier for us to buy saying, well, here's a company that does competency uh, definitions and competency frameworks. I'm gonna buy that in or uh, license it free of charge. It's sort of creative commons way. So now we're gonna get more and more of these competencies that will be understandable, informative, and there'll be some transparency. We'll say, well, these are the medical competencies that are used at national level or the regional level in this other countries. So, well, what's enabling all this also is things like natural language processing, machine learning. So tagging content to match with competencies has been hard. It's been a manual process. Someone would have to know uh, this content matches to this competency and this competency definition. But now with uh, more intelligent machines, we can start tagging up. They won't be right. They won't be 100%, but they'd be better than not having it. And we could also use kind of uh, um, social grading systems to say that was a good piece of content that helped me gain competence at this level in this the competency. So we're going to see more and more tools start evolving based on standards work, based on smart companies like Harbinger um, to make this much more practical to use going forward. So we know they've been hard in the past. They're going to become easier in the future. 
Great. And Eric, I can also see the benefit of having common defi de definition of competencies globally then, uh, which will again be very interesting for people like, you know, as Anshu said, people at uh, maybe second tier or third tier places who, who are great talented, but if they can use, get the same competencies, I think even organizations in global organizations could look at those. And as you said, they're tradable, they are shareable. So they would know how, what that person has and it will become easy for recruitment and you know so many different things so just standardizing it across i can see so many new opportunities coming up uh, in this space uh, in the coming years then what we are basically saying is at in this model of implementing competency model learning there are four th key things pretest where you find the gaps then assigning the learning paths based on the gaps a constant post-test and evaluation. This is different than what we do in e-learning, traditional e-learning, where there's just one test. In competency-based learning model, you continuously evaluate an individual at different parts of the experience and see how an individual is progressing through this. And of course, the analytics, because that's what is the key to assign the learning paths and see the difference in pre- and post-test. Now, with these mod, uh, components put together, there are four strategies one could think of in uh, presenting this learning content. The first and foremost could be if your organization already has implemented an LXP, uh, like per CPO or degree, you know, you, most of these LXP do have a way to tag content to various competencies, and then they can be used to create customized learning paths for an individual. Um, if you do not have an LXP, then how do you handle it? Well, you have an LMS, uh, but the, uh, the limitation of an LMS is you are not able to track or tag content to the competencies or even track to the level of detail one would like to. So there is a, there are three solutions which I'm uh, presenting here, uh, which could be used based on the business needs. The first thing is using a standalone pre and post test system or a module. And based on the results of these modules, one can go to an LMS manually and assign the required learning paths to an individual. In fact, uh, one of our customers who is into uh, competency-based training uh, to leadership in various Fortune 500 companies actually uses this solution where they use uh, the pre and test post test modules to know the gaps. And once they have that, they actually do one on one coaching or uh, training sessions for the individuals uh, based on the gaps they have identified. So this is could be effective in interesting ways based on the business need. Other option could be, well, many LMSs in the past did support APIs, which allowed them to integrate with different systems. So if your LMS already have some of these APIs, then based on the results of pre and post module, you could uh, as in, in, uh, share that information through API to an LMS, informing that here is an individual or an employee who has these three gaps and please assign these specific modules to this uh, employee. And then the LMS can actually just do that automation as we call it uh, to assign those modules in the right sequence. So that's another very interesting way many organizations use this uh, model for implementing it. In fact, right after this, I'll show you a quick demo where one of our customer has implemented exactly this solution in their organization. And then comes the fourth option, which could probably be useful where the LMS does not have APIs, but still someone wants to do this whole thing as a package. So what Habinger has done is we have developed a delivery learning framework, a competency-based delivery learning framework, which packages the pre-test, the post-test, and the content together into one SCOM package and can be uploaded on any traditional LMS. And it, for the learner, it gives one complete experience, right from doing a pretest, identifying the skill gaps, opening only the required modules and a post-test to see the difference. So um, 
maybe this top framework itself can be another webinar session or we can have a separate discussion around it. But for today, I thought what's interesting is to demo this uh, driving heavy vehicles competency based demo to you. In this demo, the, the, the use case was uh, uh, our customer vector solutions. It's a catalog company based out of Florida. And this company was de delivering this product, which allows to assess uh, driving competencies for heavy vehicles. And as I uh, kind of used this example earlier at the start of the webinar, that there are 12 different competencies, which is someone needs to be a good driver. So this, what Habinja did was work with Vector Solutions to de design a tool which could allow uh, uh, to test these 12 competencies. And based on that, uh, wherever uh, the lowest, the bottom two or three competencies were open through an API integration on the LMS for the learner to learn those modules. So let's just dive direct into the demo. I know we are running short on time, but I'll try and show you a quick demo of this uh, tool. Um, so this is like the landing page where I can start taking my assessment. And it guides me through some uh, 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 help information on how to use this tool. So I'm just going to quickly pass this and we'll see this example here, which you see on screen, uh, where it, it puts me in a scenario when I'm actually driving and it will ask me to find out the hazards on the way as I'm driving through this. And every time I make a wrong choice, it shows me my attempts here on the right screen. And based on how much time I take to make the right decision and how much time I take to figure out the right hazard, my competency scores get calculated. So this is where the knowledge and the reaction or the attribute of making the right decision comes into picture. So as you see, while I'm driving, I need to identify the vehicle, which is uh, in, uh, not doing the right uh, uh, job here. And if you see, I made two wrong attempts and the correct attempt at the third time. It is also counting the time I took to find the right wrong hazard. And that's how my scores get calculated. So my reaction time, incorrect attempts, and a feedback is what it may, gives me at the end of every uh, assessment question. And that's how it has designed 12 different scenarios, which I need to go through to figure out where is the gap in my comp uh, driving competencies. So while I'm driving, I realize there's this individual, which uh, you know was uh, suddenly popped out of the other car. There's the second scenario it helps me. And this is where it's asking me, how will I back out of a parking spot? So it's a 360 degree video because I'm backing out. So I need to see you know, what's going on. And I could, what I, this does is it allows me to not only just use uh, simple uh, textual uh, questions, but also scenarios of real life situations, as you can see here. And that's how I can continue uh, answering 12 different situations in a driving scenario. And this is the first time I probably answer something correctly while driving. Well, once I do these 12 questions at the end, this is what I see. It gives me a score of uh, various competencies I showed during these assessments and also score along with it. And it has highlighted the bottom two competencies where I really need to focus on to be a good driver. At this moment in this situation, what it also does is it will communicate to my LMS or the vector solutions LMS that please assign backing up safely and sharing the road with pedestrians and cyclists uh, uh, mod learning modules to Poonam as a uh, learner over here. So now when I go to my LMS, I will see these two particular modules assigned to me to take the learning content for that. And I can anytime come here again take this test again, and it will show me my new scores. And accordingly, I will be able to uh, continue with my other uh, uh, competencies where I may not be still very good. For example, preventing loss of control crashes and so on. So that's like a quick demo 
of uh, uh, the competency assessment tool for pre-test and post-test. And with that, it's time to take it to conclusion. Uh, what we saw today is skilling and reskilling is the need of the hour. And we heard from Anshu and Eric that competency-based learning is a great way to uh, solve this problem at scale and not just for today, but for future as well. Also, we know that there are traditional systems which pose some challenges of implementing it, but there are ways one can do. And we looked at four different strategies on how we could overcome these limitations um, uh, of the uh, traditional systems. And with that, I would like to thank Anshu and Eric for an amazing conversation today. And uh, over to you, Rohan, to give a quick brief about Harbinger and any questions from the audience. Hey, thank you so much. So just talking a little bit about Harbinger Interactive Learning. So we are a learning solutions and technology company helping in creating unique learning experiences uh, rapidly and cost effectively. So we were established in the year 1990, and it's been more than 30 years in business. And we've been serving clients from across the globe, right, right from North America, Europe, UK, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. Overall, as a group, we are 800 plus uh, individuals based out in the US as well as India. And uh, talking about Harbinger Interactive Learning, we have a great team of learning consultants, instructional designers, graphic designers, and visual artists. Uh, along with programmers, quality analysts, and project managers as well. And uh, the industries that we cater to, so we're not an industry-specific partner per se. We have experience working in all different types of industries that you see on your screen, right from life sciences, e-learning production houses, ed tech, retail, so on. And uh, talking about our core areas of expertise, it's been custom content development. Uh, we've been supporting a lot of our clients of late on the competency mapped learning as well. And apart from that, some new learning interventions like nudge learning, AI-driven chatbots, uh, and, and many more such learning interventions. So this is in brief about Harbinger Interactive. And with that, uh, I know we're on top of the R. And uh, thank you so much for the questions. If you have any, we're gonna be around uh, for another uh, couple of minutes. Please feel free to drop in the questions in the chat or in the Q&A pane, and we'll be more than happy to answer them offline for you. Uh, thank you, Poonam, and to our panelists for a wonderful discussion. And I'm sure we all are going back with some food for thought today. And uh, in the meanwhile, if uh, any, anything pops up, feel free to reach out to us. Um, at uh, info at harbingerlearning.com. Thank you once again, everyone. Take care and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great session. Thank you. Thank you.